how the genetics and the environment, it's, a, it's always a mix, but on this Ephraim Katsir, uh, the former president, once when he opened the meeting, he said, do you know what is the difference between genetics and environment? Nobody said anything. He said, if the farmer's son looks like the farmer, it's genetics. If he looks like the neighbor, it's the environment. <laughs> OK. Our next speaker, and after that we'll have a coffee break, uh, is uh, uh, Professor uh, Mart uh, Sarma. Uh, the director of the Laboratory of Molecular Neuroscience at the Institute of Biotechnology, University of Helsinki. So we remain in Northern Europe at that moment, for this moment. And he will talk about novel ER-located trophic factors, CDNF maintains dopamine neurons in aging. So we get into a little uh, biology. Please. So, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I have a strong voice. I, I believe you list, uh, hear me well. Yes. Good. Uh, thank you, Mira and uh, Vice President, for the very nice invitation. I will uh, make a small switch now. I'm uh, moving from uh, uh, healthy aging uh, to the diseases which are accompanied by by, by aging, and I will focus on one of the group of the diseases which is generally called neurodegenerative diseases, which mean that at certain point in certain area of the brain, neurons start to degenerate and then die. And eventually this degeneration and death uh, renders to the various symptoms uh, in, in many cases related to our movement, then called movement disorders, or then with cognitive impairment, as we know, in Alzheimer's disease and in, in dementia. Uh, I will um, start by introducing you to the, to the growth factors, which are actually the, uh, the proteins which have been in clinical trials to treat some of the neurodegenerative diseases, and I will today focus mostly on the Parkinson's disease because this is one of the, probably the only example where we have now the first success in clinical trials. So I will uh, uh, show you the data on, uh, on, on GDNF which has been in clinical trials and also the related factor, and then I will switch to a new factor what we, we discovered some 10 years ago and which is now about half a year been in the phase one, phase two clinical trials for the Parkinson's patients. Uh, so <clears throat> trophic factors or neurotrophic factors are the ones which promote neuronal survival. To make it very clear, we have in our brain, brain 100 billion neurons and uh, 99.99% of these neurons do not renew. They are post-mitotic, not replicating, not dividing cells, but they need trophic support. And this is given by special proteins, and when you take away these proteins, neurons eventually die. Another very important uh, thing for the neurons is that they have long axons and dendrites to communicate with other neurons, dopamine neurons, which are located in the midbrain, they make up to 50,000 contacts. So one neuron has to receive information for 50,000 different neurons. Imagine talking to 50,000 people at the same time. 
I, um, I must admit I have sometimes difficulties to understand what my wife is telling to me. <laughs> so, uh, neurons are doing a very, very good job. So, uh, many of you might not know that uh, uh, neurons die actually massively in development. In the brain, when uh, the child is born, about after one year after the birth, about half of the brain neurons are removed. But this is not a pathological removal, it's a developmental fine tuning of the contacts. And nature has it made it this way that it has put in this scheme four neurons to compete for two contacts. And those neurons which send the actions to the right target, make the right contacts, uh, get the life prize. And those who arrive late are lazy or make wrong synapses are brutally removed by programmed cell death. Late uh, in aging, at the age of 75, we have about 10% less brain neurons. This is a normal, healthy aging loss of neurons. And then it is accelerating. At the age of 85, we have lost already 20%, and maybe at 95 or 100, maybe half of the people already have the dementia, we have maybe lost 30% of the neurons. So nature is <clears throat> has provided proteins, which are called neurotrophic factors, to keep these neurons alive. And we have been looking whether these neurons, new, uh, these neurotrophic factors can also be used for the therapy because they keep neurons alive in the normal development and in aging. Uh, there have been three people who have played a key role in the discovery and the characterization of the neurotrophic factors, and these are from the right, Victor Hamburger, who already in the 30s were working on the, uh, in St. Louis, uh, the uh, Washu showed that the chicken limb is secreting something which keeps neurons alive. And then Rita Levi Montaccini, uh, an Italian Jew who was not allowed to work during the war in the University of Torino, conducted the very first experiments in her kitchen. And then when moving to also to Washu, to the lab of Victor Hamburger, actually demonstrated that this is a protein which is secreted by the limb and keeps neurons alive. And then Stan Cohen, the student of, uh, of uh, Rita, took and biochemically characterized this protein. I, I show this um, slide for two reasons. One, I want to pay great respect to Rita, whom I knew very well, but also if you carefully look at the picture, you notice that Victor died at 100, 102, Rita at 103, and Stan is still alive. So the students in the audience, remember, working in this area <laughs> is, is really, really good. So now to the Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a age-related disorder. Uh, in average, we, uh, we get the disease at the age of 55, and when uh, we are 75, maybe 2.5 to 3% of the people already have the Parkinson's disease. Altogether in the planet Earth, we have now maybe 10 million people with Parkinson's disease, and the number is increasing because, as we heard, uh, we, we, we live now longer and the treatments are better. So this is known as the uh, movement disorder, but actually this is also the tip of the iceberg. It's a much more complex disease. It's also accompanied by a massive uh, non-motor symptoms. <clears throat> so what happens in disease that the dopaminergic neurons in the area called substantia nigra pars compacta in both hemispheres, about half a million dopamine neurons, start to regenerate and die. And according to the present understanding, <coughs> they die by the so-called 
dying back mechanism. And that is to say that they send axons to the caudate putamen where they make synopsis, and there they release also dopamine. And this dopamine is crucially important to control most of our uh, movements. So they first lose the synaptic contact, then the axons start to generate, and then eventually the cell bodies die. And this is supported by the autopsy data when we look at the, uh, at the patients we see that uh, when motor symptoms appear, uh, about half of the dopaminergic neurons already wiped away. There has been already a massive destruction. And in accordance with what I said, uh, the, the level of dopamine or the number of fibers here is actually only 30 to 40 percent. So it's probably quite important to tell that uh, we lack efficient treatment for this disease. All treatments that we have at the moment is symptomatic. We can alleviate the symptoms, but these neurons continue to degenerate and die. And therefore, the major goal is actually to find treatments which could slow down or even stop the disease progression. And the second very, very important point is that we are not able to diagnose the disease before we see the motor symptoms. Although we know that people having later having Parkinson's disease have usually constipation, they also have problems with olfaction, and then there are some other problems like uh, sleep disorders, but we don't have enough data that saying that this is always following by Parkinson's disease. So we badly need also biomarkers and new diagnostics to have the, uh, have the diagnosis as, as, as early as possible. I want to uh, also say uh, that uh, nothing is new under the sun. We celebrated last year, 200 years uh, uh, of the essay written by James Parkinson's Shaking Palsy. But actually, a few years ago, it was published that uh, already 300 years before the Christ, Indians in their Ayurveda have described a disease called Kampavata, which symptoms are rigidity, tremor, depression, exactly, Parkinson's. But even more impressive, they in here in this uh, uh, Ayurveda uh, recommend treatment. And the treatment is to use extract from a common bean in India called Mukura prurians. Uh, and this was shown in 1937 to be very rich of Levodopa. Levodopa is a major treatment. So imagine, uh, 2,300 years ago, we had actually the treatment already. Another thing that I want to uh, say is that um, when I uh, showed that uh, photo at the seminar at the University College London, a gentleman um, rose and said, this is not James Parkinson's, because uh, 200 years we, uh, ago we didn't have photography. This is a pediatrician, uh, James Parkinson, who was living 100 years ago. So I don't know, is it James Parkinson's picture or not? But he, he, he did the job. So um, the situation what we have in the patient when uh, the disease is diagnosed is more or less the following. About 50% of the neurons here shown by yellow are still alive. They make dopamine, they re release it, and they activate our muscles. About 10 to 15% of the neurons are still able to make dopamine, but they lack the synaptic contact. And then maybe 10, 15% of the neurons are still alive, but they are not able to make dopamine. And they, of course, have a massive uh, degeneration of the axons. And then we have dead neurons, and dead is dead. Nothing to do. But these three are our targets. We want to keep these neurons al alive because they, if we don't treat them, they will die. And we will like to regenerate these neurons to make new synapses and then stimulate these neurons to make, again, dopamine and make synopsis. So is it possible? 
Yes, it is possible, at least in animal models of Parkinson's disease, where two growth factors called GDNF and nurturing. These are the proteins which bind to the core receptors and uh, uh, signals to the uh, red receptor that we actually discovered some 20 years ago. And uh, these two proteins uh, have been shown in any other experiments to be able to protect and repair dopaminergic neurons, exactly as I showed in the scheme. But there are problems. They don't work when we have a very severe loss of neurons, more than 60, 70 percent. And that is uh, five, six years after the diagnosis. And then it has not been also effective, at least at GDNF, in animal models where, where, where alpha synuclein has been been um, overexpressed. Alpha synuclein is a protein which is located in the Lewy bodies, and Lewy bodies are protein aggregates, which are the hallmark of, pro of Parkinson's disease. Almost all neurons, dopamine neurons, which are degenerating, contain these protein aggregates. And many people now think that this alpha synuclein is actually a, a key killer of dopaminergic neurons. And some people even think that uh, because this protein has some properties of the prion protein, it can move from cell to cell, that it might be the major cause and reason for the Parkinson's disease. But I think the jury is still out, and we, we don't have yet the final conclusion. Is it really so important? So uh, GDNF and nurturing have been in clinical trials for the Parkinson's disease. I'll, I'll be very short here. GDN has been in two phase two clinical trials. And to cut the long story short, uh, although there has been no clear clinical benefit on, on Parkinson's patients, in the both phase two clinical trials were designed very poorly. And the real conclusion is that GDN still might be very efficient, but the trial was not well designed. The picture is a little bit better. There have been uh, two phase two clinical trials with nurturing using gene therapy. I just show you the picture I, I, I took from Steve Gill, who conducted a phase one trial uh, pumping with a Medtronic mini pump, which was uh, inserted under the skin through the ultrathin catheter into the caudate putamen the GDNF protein. And this open-label study, GDNF worked extremely well. But then in the phase two clinical trial uh, conducted by the Amgen company uh, with uh, proper controls, they used a completely different catheter and they don't, didn't see the symptomatic compar uh, uh, improvement compared to placebo. But there were big problems, as I said, with the, with the design and with the catheter. This is a picture of the phase two clinical trials for the nurturing gene therapy. And I just want to show you that if you take the, the whole population of, uh, of uh, uh, 55 patients, you see the statistically dif significant difference starting from one year of the treatment. This is a control, and this is a treatment, and this is a motor, motor improvement. But when, when, when they look then from these patients, the, the population of the patients which uh, uh, late stage Parkinson's disease, you see no difference between the placebo and control. But when they took the early stage Parkinson's patients, diagnosis within five years, there is absolutely robust clinical effect. And this is quite clear when we look at the autopsy of the Parkinson's patients, this brown color or gray color for your eyes now probably uh, is showing the, the fibers of the dopaminergic neurons. This is a control. This is one year, three years, four years, five years after the diagnosis. Uh, you don't need to be a neuroanatomist to see that uh, there is not much fibers left after five years. There is not much to rescue after five years. So the very clear conclusion is that we have to start this treatment as early as possible. And therefore, uh, we need as early as possible diagnosis. Starting treatment at 
11 years uh, patients with growth factors. He's, the, the, the battle is lost before it begins. So what we have learned from the animal studies and from the clinical trials, and we, we have actually, in the case of nurturing, shown that it can slow down neurodegeneration in Parkinson's patients. This actually is the first time in the, in the history where we see a slowdown of neurodegeneration in the chronic neurological disease and in neurodegeneration. Well, it's still modest, but we, we, we know there is a proof of principle. Delivery is a problem. We have to do the intracranial uh, uh, surgery, and that is, of course, complicated, although 200,000 patients now walk around with a deep brain stimulator, and the, the surgery is actually very similar. Uh, these guys diffuse poorly in the brain. They don't work in the alpha synuclein model. And then uh, I underline or put in other color that treatment should be started as soon as possible. And of course, we are working hard to find ways to deliver other ways than through the brain, brain delivery. So I now switch to our protein, to our child, which I love very much, and because it's a protein which is very, very different what we have learned from other neurotrophic factors, and uh, it works also quite nicely, at least in animal models of Parkinson's disease. Uh, Paivi, uh, my graduate student at that time, and I, uh, back in 2007, discovered two proteins. We called them cerebral dopamine neurotrophic factor and mesencephalic astrocyte-derived neurotrophic factor. These are proteins with a signal sequence telling that they are secreted. And then they, with yellow vertical bars, I have depicted conserved cysteines telling that these proteins form SS bridges. Uh, the, uh, when we looked uh, into the database, we saw no homology to any other protein, which was very surprising. Then, because the structure of the protein was not known, we saw the, first the crystal structure and then also the, the solution NMR structure of these proteins. And th then we become, became wiser. We learned that there are two domains, the N-terminal domain and the C-terminal domain. And then we realized that there is actually a very interesting sequence of the carboxy terminus, and this is an ER retention signal. That is like a postmark for the protein which sends it to the ER and keeps it in the ER. So these proteins are largely endoplasmatic reticulum located proteins and secreted mostly in the stress and in the injury. We soon learned that these proteins, in addition to promoting the survival of neurons, like other proteins do, they also regulate the unfolded protein response machinery, UPR. This is a machinery, I don't have time to go into the details, which is maintaining protein homeostasis. When protein starts to aggregate, then cell is trying to get rid of the aggregates. They, they are like cleaning ladies in the cell. And it, it turns out that our, our proteins are stimulating these cleaning ladies, helping them to get the junk out of the, of the, of the cells. And alpha-synuclein is a major troublemaker in dopamine neurons. It is a major aggregate, and our protein helps to get rid of the alpha-synuclein. In addition, we have also recently shown and uh, we, we, we are lucky that there was a recent paper in Science supporting our data that our growth factor is also, by a still unknown mechanism, stimulating the synthesis and re, uh, uh, the, in, inhibiting the synthesis and, and release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, kind of suppressing the inflammation. So we went to test our protein in the animal models of Parkinson's disease. Uh, most of the experiments in rodents have been done by my postdoc. Maria H. Wodilainen, and Maria, uh, by injecting the, the protein into the brain, was able to show that, indeed, our protein very efficiently protects dopamine neurons uh, in control animals which have received the toxin, 6 dopamine 
after 12 weeks, only 25% of the neurons are left, but our protein completely blocks the death. And then when we look at the motor behavior, we can show that after 12 weeks, the single treatment with the protein almost returns the normal motor behavior. I, I don't spend much on the rodent data because this has been uh, largely published, but I will now switch to the very more recent and unpublished uh, non-human primate data, which we conducted in con co collaboration with uh, Judy Cameron at the University of Pittsburgh with the help of the very large grant from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So we have used here uh, Rezo's monkeys, uh, the middle-aged uh, Rezo's monkeys. These are very expensive experiments. One monkey costs more or less like a small car, 18,000 uh, US dollars. So uh, the, groups are, the groups are therefore very small because we don't want to waste these precious animals. So we have one group of, uh, with a control, one group with a GDNF, which has been shown to work in this model, and then two doses of our growth factor. And what we do, we inject the MPTP into the right carotis, uh, uh, having the lesion on the right hemisphere, which then will have effect on the left side motorics. And then uh, each animal is going into the positron emission tomography. We test whether there is a neurodegeneration. And there you can see here very nicely, this is the right side where we injected the toxin. There is about 70% uh, loss of dopaminergic neurons. We don't have six animals in all groups, largely because animals respond very differently to the toxins. Uh, they, uh, three animals did not respond, actually. After six weeks, we start to treat our animals with a single injection of the, of the protein, unfortunately still into the brain. And we do then four consecutive intermittent injections. And then during all the lifetime of the animals, we conduct both the analysis of motor and non-motor symptoms. Uh, just to show you that uh, our protein is indeed, compared to GDENF, much better diffusing. We used here another monkey because they are cheaper. Uh, and we uh, calculated the diffusion volume. Our protein is about four times better diffusing than GDN. And then we used the analysis of motor symptoms, non-motor symptoms, and then uh, out after euthanasia, we did also some post-motor neurochemical analysis. <clears throat> this is actually analysis which is done to all patients also if they enter the enter the, uh, enter the uh, clinic. There are three independent people following the motor behavior of the animal. And zero is a normal animal, and 100 is uh, having a, a real problems in motor, motor movement. You clearly see with the vehicle, you see also some effect. There is always a placebo. And then GDNF shows improvement but statistically significant improvement only after uh, the last injection. CDNF, as you can see, shows statistically significant effect immediately, and there is a very little variation, and finally the effect is 55% recovery, which has actually uh, never seen before. Uh, w w having had a very nice effect on the overall motor improvement, we looked then on the fine motor uh, uh, improvement. Uh, in this experiment, animals take food with right and left hand, and we score how many times they use left hand, which is affected, versus right hand. And you can see that in the case of uh, vehicle and in the GDNF, they don't use the left hand at all. Whereas in the case, especially with the lower dose of CDNF, they use every second time uh, the, the, the left hand, telling that in, ad in addition to the uh, uh, overall motor improvement, there is also improvement in the fine motor coordination, given hope that you can maybe start to use a pen or maybe even play the piano if things go well. And this correlates quite well with the number of dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra pars compacta. 
we see also the regeneration of the neurons. We see also that the lower dose of the CDNF and GDNF really rescue neurons from the death. So, and then we look at the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. As I mentioned, um, this, is, um, you know, this is a hidden area. It has been a little bit forgotten. Uh, this would uh, encounter lack of motivation, depression, constipation, sleep disorders, cognitive impairment. Uh, and these actually affect the patient life, sometimes even more than the motor symptoms. Imagine if you have a member of the, of the family who is uh, depressive and which uh, sleep uh, rhythm has completely changed, running around during the midnight and then sleeping during the days. So we try to ask whether our growth factor has any effect on the, on the uh, non-motor symptoms. And we looked first on the motivation. And we can see that um, in the case of motivation, both doses of the, of the seed and about 40% improved motivation. And this, surprisingly, is not correlated with the number of neurons in the substantia nigra pars compacta. We also looked at the depressive behavior using the so-called human intruder test. And this is a test what has been uh, developed by, by uh, Judy Cameron. Uh, it actually uh, registers uh, the reaction of the animal to the animal caretaker. And see that uh, 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 really improves uh, the, mm, uh, the antidepressive state of the, of the animals. So what we have shown here is that CDNF um, uh, protects and rescues dopamine neurons in animal models of Parkinson's disease. We can protect these neurons, we can regenerate these neurons, and we can also, to a certain extent, uh, they differentiate neurons and make them to, to synthesize dopamine. We, we have set up a company a few years ago, and now the, the, the protein is in phase two, one, two clinical trials. Uh, this, is the, this is a multicenter study with six, altogether 18 patients, six in Helsinki, uh, two centers in, in Sweden, Karolinska and Lund, and we use the Renishaw technology, it's a British company, to deliver uh, the, the protein into the, into the brain. Um, we started uh, off uh, in uh, October 2017, and we are expecting the results uh, on the safety, tolerability, and uh, device performance, and also initial data on the efficacy by maybe March 2019. So I, I want to stay alive until that time. So I don't know, do I have time yet, or I should stop here? So I will, uh, I will stop here, and uh, thank you for your attention. Questions, Uh, we have tested that in rats, and uh, we, we recently published a paper on that, and we, we see uh, not complete additive effect, but uh, statistically significant additive effect. The, both factors uh, kind of activate the anti-apoptotic pathway, and there we don't see that additive, uh, additive effect, but then we see also the anti-inflammatory, and as I see, the anti-UPR, uh, and that finally uh, renders to the quite significant. To, to take that to the clinic, of course, the two, two factors together means that you have to start from, the, from point zero. Is there any direction of uh, neuro neurogenesis uh, developed for Yeah, <clears throat> the question is whether dopamine neurons uh, regenerate spontaneously, whether there is a birth of new dopamine neurons in, in the human brain. 
Um, this is an excellent question, and it's heavily debated. Uh, it looks, uh, I'm summarizing uh, maybe literature of uh, 50 papers. The vast majority of the papers show that there is virtually no neurogenesis of dopaminergic neurons, but this mostly comes from the rodent data. Uh, the few data using the uh, uh, isotope uh, uh, method show that there might be some neurogenesis in human brain, but it's a very, very modest. So that would definitely not contribute significantly to the massive deaths of dopamine neurons in the, in the Parkinson's. And what would you say are the, you were talking about the problems with early diagnosis, right? mm -hmm. what would you say are the major barriers to early diagnosis? Because Parkinson's, other like, unlike other neurogenesis and general diseases like dementia, the Parkinson has a better uh, press. It's more legitimate. Dementia, you don't want to know in advance. Uh, so why is this the problem with early diagnosis? Well, um, maybe the, the, one of the problems is that uh, uh, this area of research has been not sufficiently funded. Its importance has not been uh, realized until very recently. Now, Michael J. Fox Foundation has put a lot of effort to, to, to the biomarkers and the early diagnosis. It has been more done in a hobby-like uh, way, and this is not the way one should do it. Uh, the other thing is that um, maybe we have looked uh, things a little bit differently. Why should uh, a change in the brain be reflected in the serum? People have looked changes in the serum. It's not at all evident. Uh, there you should have a leakage in the blood-brain blood barrier to see some changes in the serum. This is not necessarily the case. But uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, I, I was recently attending a, a, a co conference and there are some uh, uh, very interesting possibilities. The other very important thing is a, is a live imaging of the human brain to see in the living brain whether or not you have lost dopaminergic neurons. It's possible now with a positron emission tomography, but you have to have money with a rucksack with you. You have to inject money into the brain. Almost, <laughs> almost, yes, uh, almost gold. Right. <coughs> so the, the, the I, I will repeat them. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I, I told about the alpha synuclein, the protein, which is a, a major component of the of the Lewy bodies, and there is a hypothesis that alpha synuclein may function as a prion protein, and that means that it is able to mm. move from one cell to another, uh, converting in the new cell, uh, the similar proteins into the pathogenic prion-like proteins. So um, it is extremely popular hypothesis. It's a very hot hypothesis, so it's... Uh, exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. And it kind of matches quite well with, uh, with the data from the German neuroanatomist Heiko Brach. Uh, uh, but um, I think... Uh, uh, we have been a little bit blinded by the enthusiasm. Much of the data what we have uh, seen in the publication uh, has been published in a rush. Some of the there was a study where they did implantations and the only step yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. they were yeah. kind of infected by the... Yeah, 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 the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, uh, a colleague is referring to the study, uh, that's actually two studies, one in US, one in Sweden, by Patrick Burdin's lab, where they uh, did the grafts of human uh, embryonic brain to the Parkinson's patients some 20 years ago. And now when these patients died, they do the, did the autopsy and noticed that, oh, also the grafted cells, which are completely clean and healthy, have been contaminated by the alpha synuclein. But these are two studies. And there were uh, about uh, three patients in one and two in another. 
uh, yeah, I got excited too, but uh, I still, I'm not saying that uh, alpha synuclein is a prior protein. It looks like, but we need more data. Yep. 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 True. Yep. That is a beautiful review on that. Uh, if uh, I can send it to you, it, which, uh, which is critical, puts pro and pros and cons. Thank you very much.